Hi, this is Steve from Retro Man Blog, and welcome to this very special episode of Retro Sonic Podcast. So recently, someone asked me how I first became aware of that sort of genre, garage rock and psych music. And uh, I think for me, it was probably from seeing the Meteors and Screaming Lord Such at the Lyceum back in 1982. And then, of course, uh, seeing the Cramps. And I was completely blown away by seeing the Prisoners and the Milkshakes on that excellent TV show, The Tube, in 1984. And then from going to gigs at the much-missed Clarendon in Hammersmith, there was always a great mix of psychobilly, punk, goth and garage bands. I was also become obsessed by the Ramones Surfing Bird. And although at first I didn't twig that it was a cover version, until I got the excellent combination Rockabilly Psychosis and the Garage Disease, which featured the original. And that record was also the first time I heard the Sonic Psycho. And that led to a sort of an awakening into the world of obscure 60s psych and garage rock, fueled even further by the reissue of Lenny Kay's classic compilation, Nuggets, uh, original artifacts from the first psychedelic era, 1965 to 1968. And of course, the Damned's alter ego, Naz Nomad and the Nightmares, and the brilliant covers album, Give Daddy the Knife Cindy. In fact, The Damned were also pivotal in introducing me to, to more contemporary 60s-influenced bands, you know, not just those old nuggets. So I was looking through some copies of my old cut-and-paste DIY fanzine out of step from the early 80s. I guess you could say it was the sort of vintage analogue version of Retro Man blog and Retro Sonic podcast. And the memories came flooding back. You know, in one issue of Out of Step, there's a big interview with Doctor and the Medics, a band I first discovered after seeing them support The Damned. And uh, before they hit number one in the charts with Spirit in the Sky, Doctor and the Medics were pretty cool, believe it or not. You know, running the 60s-inspired nightclub Alice in Wonderland in Soho and releasing some suitably tripped-out psychedelic records. And then, flicking through another issue of Out of Step, there's a feature on the Fuzz Tones from New York. And that was another band that I discovered, thanks to a fantastic support set. You know, that was when they played with the Damned at the Hammersmith Pallet. I think they were the first band I'd seen with that classic 60s look of bowl haircuts and bone necklaces. And they had a really cool blonde, Debonair, on Farfisa organ. And they just released their classic album, Lysergic Emanations. And I was hooked. And then, through their shows with the Damned, the Fuzz Tones raised their profile in the UK... But there were more bands on the other side of the Atlantic, such as Liars, The Miracle Workers and Chesterfield Kings, who were influenced by the psychedelic sounds of the 60s. But there was also a band from Montreal in Canada, The Gruesomes. And believe it or not, despite forming in 1985, The Gruesomes will be playing the UK for the very first time. And that's thanks to our good friends at Weirdsville. And that's at the Fiddler's Elbow in Camden on Saturday, July the 2nd. And the show also includes support from the superb Jack Cade. DJ Keb Darge will be making a guest appearance on the decks. And of course, we'll be there to bring you all the action. Well, in the meantime, before that long-awaited show, I'm very pleased to welcome the Gruesomes, all the way from Montreal. So welcome, and uh, please introduce yourself to our listeners. Hey, Steve. Okay. Hi. So uh, John uh, John Noel on drums. John Davis on bass. Bobby Beaton, guitar singer. Jerry Alvarez, guitar singer. Great. Well, it's nice to get all four of you together. So I guess you're rehearsing for the upcoming shows. And uh, what have you got planned? Uh, we play a bunch of uh, old chestnuts from our uh, old set. Uh... Yeah. Well, I ran a. I did a. I did a. I ran down our set list, and then I made a pie chart from it showing where the songs come from so a big chunk of the pie like about 70 percent of the stuff is from songs from our records so if someone has ever heard gruesome's record they would uh you know they would know the song and, the, and then the rest of the set is it's like covers of well yeah like mostly mostly like some really well loved garage covers that we certainly love and maybe there's some garage fans there they might even recognize them too yeah, the fun for us of doing these sets is that we get to pick and choose our favorite songs from a large repertoire of tunes we know. So a couple of classics we do is one two five from a Montreal band from the sixties, The Haunted. <laughs> Alright. 
very proud that the haunted 125 is possibly the best known garage song of all time and those guys are from our hometown so we always play that yeah so we keep that's always with us and then other covers it's stuff all oh, just like cool stuff like from you know texas garage and it's all it's all like like american and canadian garage covers along with the songs that we've uh, put on our records so i yeah. guess that's what the set is no new stuff, kids. We're not, we're not taking the band in a new direction yeah. or anything. Yeah. We, and we have new songs, <laughs> but Bobby strictly said, I don't want to make people suffer by hearing songs they don't know at our show. Yeah. So we're not playing them. No, like you got one chance to see this band, and they come, all right, we're taking the band in a new direction, man. This is from our new idea. <laughs> yeah, for, you know. yeah. We released a record, a single, a couple years ago, and we're yeah. doing a couple of the songs from that. Yeah. Someone told a lie. Uh, that's the newest thing we did. Yeah. Yes, but it, but yes, exactly. It's new, but it's actually out there. So there's half a chance that someone might have heard it. So yeah, yeah. nobody is getting surprised, yeah. especially not us. As a matter of fact, we've, <laughs> we've been playing a lot of the festival circuit in Spain and yeah. Mexico, places like that. And we're, we're usually the most traditional garage band on the bill in that what we're doing yeah. is very close to what we were doing in 1986, 87. Yeah. Yeah, so we're like, yeah, when we end up on one of these uh, Euro festival bills and stuff, we're usually, I think, almost always by far the most orthodox of, yeah. of the garage of the garage revival acts. So. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, we're looking forward to, to seeing you, you know, and it will be, I said, the first taste of the, of the UK audience to, to get to see you play. So, yeah, right, so in, in, in my sort of rambling intro, I mentioned sort of some of my first garage rock awakening so what were your first experiences you know was well, was there a pretty much ex- exact same as make an impact on you yeah well actually I, I think it was interesting to hear that rundown because it really is garage through this through a sort of british filter so we we like a lot of that same same stuff as you just mentioned but maybe came into it from a different direction like for instance to us if i'm correct guys there was never any link to like rockabilly psychabilly with our no, with stuff, but i right? did have that record rockabilly psychosis in the garage yeah. disease yeah, yeah it's a great I record. remember it was was the gun club on that too i think that's how i yeah, got that's it. right gun club it was a mix of sort of con- yeah. contemporary bands and then they had um i think a couple of psychobilly type bands on there but also like i said the sonics and the trash men and, and i think uh, that we had that too and that would that would be one of the things also the prisoners for us bob and jerry and i were very much into mod stuff when we were in high school all and right. we liked all the chords and the purple hearts and the jam and the all that stuff so so we the prisoners sort of fit a bit into that category but then they were doing something more american and psychedelic and yeah. we got into yeah. the, we're all big prisoners fans Some people say that love is like a hurricane 
they're actually reforming and playing. They're also come playing again in uh, in December for the first time in, in in sort of quite a few years. So that's good news. And I've done a lot of work with Graham Day and the and the chords you mentioned. I've done podcasts with Buddy from from the yeah. Course he course. does the, the wow. Buddy Ascot. The yeah. Drum- yeah. When I was when I was I think fifteen, I went to the UK and I was trying to find the chords album and I couldn't find it. So later, my cousin from lived in London. He he, he mailed it to me by old mail and that was the, the only copy in canada for yeah, yeah for sure for and, sure and and you know it's it's funny that a, a lot of those old records we used to have of 45s of the purple hearts and all that stuff we i got rid of over the years and i recently purchased a massive collection of mostly mod records and got all yeah. of the ones back that i got rid of years ago yeah including yeah. mods made a 79 with the misprint on the cover oh right yeah that's a classic yeah yeah, yeah. oh well that's good well i will try and get buddy to come along to the to the show you know hey, and, oh, the, drummer, the, the drummer from the chords man yeah. if he's oh, listening man, to this i'll never hear the last of it you know <laughs> oh i don't know we love the chords we still think yeah, you know how you maybe know how, tomorrow one of the best records ever yeah you know how he plays right it's just yeah. all rolls like all the time like he never stops rolling it's yeah it's 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 the most yeah yeah, he's like the most dynamic out of all those uh, mod drummers. No question about it. He's great, man. But, but- oh, that's that's well, that's a nice surprise. I'm glad to hear that. Well, I'll tell you what. I'm gonna I'm gonna just sort of break with tradition. I'm gonna sneak in a little bit of maybe tomorrow, just for you and just yes. for Buddy. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's fantastic chords maybe tomorrow well it wasn't what i was expecting to start off with <laughs> but it, but it's good to see but i think like you mentioned about the, the british look at it the, the view of the garage scene but yeah i mean i think at the time for us it was like there was this maybe crossover from a lot of the influence was from the cramps i think when they come over so you had the psychobilly thing was maybe taken from the cramps you had the milkshakes who were doing more that sort of beatles hamburg era stuff the prisoners right. being like the, the sort of small faces the hammond organ that so there was a big a lot of crossover of, of styles there wasn't really one orthodox like you said going back to the orthodoxy there wasn't anything like that i guess at the time i think it was uh, when i said when i saw the fuzz tones that was the first time i saw a band that had that when you say that orthodox garage yes garage look yeah know? So we're talking about the bowl, the bowl haircuts and like the yeah. paisley and the leather and the and especially the beetle boots, right? This but, uh, is, you guys, you guys probably know this, but in Canada, the popular music music charts are much closer to the states, meaning that there is not a lot of crossover from the underground up to the top of the charts and then down again. The okay. charts are a whole lot less dynamic. So whereas in in uh, in the UK, for instance, punk broke big underground and then those bands ended up on top of the top of the pops and having chart hits. Mod broke broke big underground. And next thing you know, bands like Secret Affair and the Chords are getting top, you know, top forty numbers and stuff. Yeah. This didn't happen over here. There were underground movements, but there's no way that any record executive would take a chance on the next, ah, the next big thing. Except the one exception, Bobby. Who's that? The Teen Beats doing "I Can't Control Myself." <laughs> yeah. Speaking of mods, for your mod audiences out there, the Teen Beats had like a top 
10 hit here in Quebec, where we're from, with their cover of I Can't Control Myself by the Trogs. And, the and they actually flew the Team Beats over here to play in front of people yeah. in 79. Yeah, and, and, and what happened was the roller skating was very big at that time, and a few <laughs> DJs at the roller skating rink would play the Team Beats, and it got really popular. So people started calling and asking radio stations to the point where they ended up with a top 10 hit here in Ontario, I think. Yeah, yeah. Quebec wow. and Ontario. That's, yeah, so they came over here. We didn't see yeah. them. We were but, too young. But that, that's, as, that's as close as we're retro music ever got to public consciousness here in Canada. It just didn't happen. So the garage music we played was always, by definition, underground. And there was no hope in heck that you would ever get picked up and promoted as a mainstream artist here. It just just didn't happen. Yeah, yeah. yeah no chance. It was always very underground. But we definitely yeah. came into the garage via the mod revival type stuff and things like The Prisoners. And then we discovered that there was, I think, Bob's mom had a boyfriend who had a Chesterfield Kings album and the Nuggets cop. And he said, hey, Bobby, you probably like this. So we were like given to this by an adult when we were teenagers. Right. Listening yeah. to Nugget, the Nuggets, Lenny K comp and the first Chesterfield yeah. Kings record. And then realizing that there was compilations like Back from the Grave as well. And uh, Pebbles. Yeah. yeah. Bands like uh, The Count Five, like uh, yeah. Psychotic Reaction. That, yeah. It's a we garage the, the, song, but the, the, it had a crossover. Yeah, The Music Machine, all those kinds of records. So we got into it from that. And then we started getting more into the American stuff. I, we love Pebbles. Was it Pebbles Volume 6 with all the British bands on it? We covered Leave My Kitten Alone from that. I still love yeah. it. I still think it's one of the strongest of those Pebbles series. <laughs> Right, so we, so we did gravitate a little bit towards that British beat music and R&B, but for the most part, we took our cues from those uh, reissue records that were coming out at the time, like Back from the Grave especially, mostly because there was an emphasis on primitive playing. You don't have to be very good to play this stuff, and we weren't very good, and we wanted to play stuff. So the you know, three-chord songs that sounded really primitive were great because we could go play a gig after only having learned to play instruments after just you know six months, and we always had the angle that, yeah, it sounds really cheap and primitive because it's supposed to sound oh, like we that. were terrible. <laughs> we, we listened to old, if you listen to old tapes of the Goosebumps playing, we're fighting on stage, insulting, like I'm insulting my brother. Uh, like, what's this? This is the next song my brother's gonna sing. What's it called? I'm an asshole. I'm yeah, like, this stupid <laughs> shit. Like, just like, and like taking like, like the song would be a minute and a half, and then we'd take two minutes to get our shit together for the next song. Yeah. It was awful. Yeah, yeah. Zero, zero, <laughs> pro, zero professionalism and, and definitely showmanship, but not controlled showmanship. Just, yeah. just, uh, so was there, was there a particular sort of, um, I mean, let's sort of um, pick a track. Was there something that you heard that you thought, wow, this is what I want the Gruesomes to sound like? Was, was there a sort of a pivotal moment or a, a song that you said, you know, this back, is... First Back from the Grave record was big. We, we liked the Gravedigger 5 was really, I mean, we sound a lot like that. Our first record sounds a lot like the first Gravedigger 5 record. Yeah. We, were, we, we thought their, their song selection of covers was great. And it was executed poorly enough that we thought we could do something similar. Yeah. Well, do you want to pick a track? Let's let's pick um, pick a track that you would say you know really takes you back to those early days of the gruesomes and when when you sort of thought, yeah, God, this is what I want to sound like. Yes. Don't tread on me by Kitten the Outlaws. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah an old an old sixty song that we loved. Well, let's hear it, shall we? Let's let's hear an early influence on the gruesomes. Don't tread on me by Kitten the Outlaws. <laughs> Oh, 
Oh, that was great that's, that's fantastic to hear some of your early influences and that so how did you all sort of meet and and get the band together you know i mean you said you're influenced by all these different styles including like the mod revival or this guy but, but how did you sort of get together and did you decide then yeah this is what we want to be like we this is what we want the gruesomes to, to, to sort of look like and sound like and you, you sort of decided to sort of take almost like go back and try and capture that vintage sound right. and go back to the 60s in, in that side Right. Okay. I think I can handle this one. It was a period in the 80s that now you were seeing retro hip. So everything that was going down in our city and that we thought was cool on an underground level was always working with old 60s influences. And and it's sort of beyond, like, there's always been a nostalgia, you know, bands like, you know, Shanana and you guys, I know there's lots of English bands that do the same sort of thing. But, but the whole idea of taking those influences and then mixing them with other stuff and sort of recasting and reformulating them, I guess that was the big thing in the 1980s. I guess that you saw it everywhere, right? Architecture was going like postmodern where they're trying to like, you know, work in old influences and stuff like that. So, so a, a retro angle was, was really uh, something that, that, uh, that a lot of people were working with. So that was natural to us. And we also wanted to mix into it other elements, like from uh, bad movies, uh, cartoon shows, right? Yeah, and musically, we also, Bob and I listened to a lot of punk rock when we were young growing up. All those British bands, like The Undertones and Stiff Little Fingers and Champ 69 and uh, all, all that stuff. We Bob was a huge fan of The Clash. Right. The Damned yeah. was huge to us. We loved The Yeah, Damned. we loved The Damned. And I think what all those bands have in common is that they were very musically distinct from the what was then the current trend of, uh, trend of, of punk music, which was like California hardcore, yeah. which is yeah. completely different different feel yeah, and, and style. Like that. that was never our thing. Although many bands around us were playing that sort of style, we, we weren't into that at all. We liked the retro 60s stuff. Buzzcocks. Yeah. As yeah. well as like the, the, maybe like the pre-19, like up to 1979 style of, yeah, of, uh, sure. of punk. Sure. Also, we were also influenced like the original garage, American garage bands by the British invasion bands, the Kinks, Early Stones. Right. Pretty Things, Who. That's, yeah. yeah. We, so yeah, we the were, earliest songs we ever played, I think, were like, uh, Hey, You Get Off of My Cloud by the Stones, yeah. Gloria them, by them. Yeah, uh, I yeah. can only give everything about those kind of tunes. Well, I was going to say, what was, I mean, that's a good chance to, to sort of throw in another, another track here. So what would, what would be a staple? If we were going back to you sort of starting off the band, you know, you said you're fighting, you're insulting each other and throwing symbols around, I guess. And then 
you, you're sort of, I guess, starting off trying to play covers. What was a staple cover of the time? Was it one of those beat sixties British beat songs, or what were you doing? Were you what was one of your favorite covers oh, up to we play? The Outsiders. Well, Bob, what's a good Outsiders one we used to play with my brother? Oh, we played them all. I uh, thinking about today, right? Uh, that's your problem. No, Filthy Rich. Filthy Rich. Yeah, that, we used to play Filthy Rich by the Outsiders. We love your, that. That's your problem. I guess the song that we jumped on probably at one of our first shows ever and still continue to play is all right and we have to we have to track this down the song is jack the ripper yeah right but where we got it from was that terrible record by the band the one-way streets which was reissued on i'm going to say back from the grave volume one really really early we thought wow this is amazing it's just the peter gun riff with some idiot screaming about jack the ripper on it this is the greatest thing i've ever heard (laughs) we can do it too we can scream like idiots over the peter gun riff as well and so we did. We put that into our into our set. Wow, Jack the Ripper! Wow, and have been playing it. I guess to this day. I just want to point out that it really has nothing to do with you know that Joe Meek screaming Lord such Jack the Ripper, right? It's 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 <laughs> really it's its own its own thing. If anyone out there has heard this song, uh, you, you'll you'll quickly see that. Yeah, and then the horrors right. sort of copied our version. Well, of we it. don't know, but yeah, they did. They did. They said it. Okay, because I was in a I was in a store in Montreal years and years ago, and I hear Jack the Ripper being played on the radio in the store, like over the over the the sound system in in, in the store, and I hear it, and I'm thinking, wow, that's clearly someone doing a cover of Jack the Ripper. They seem to be doing the one-way streets version, but it sure as heck sounds like our arrangement on our record. I couldn't, <laughs> couldn't figure out like what was going on. I felt like Homer when he found the box of Mr. Sparkle with his face on it, because I couldn't make the connection as to, as to why I was hearing this. It wasn't the gruesomes, but it seemed to be based on our arrangement of this weird song. And Jerry, you yeah, met the guys from the horrors, yeah, didn't I met, you? Yeah, uh, I met him, uh, yeah, one of the show, after the show they did in Toronto. And uh, yeah, I introduced myself and he totally uh, knew who I was, who we were, and <laughs> everything. The look, too. They had the bull haircuts and the boots and all that, too. Fantastic. It's so crazy. This is a band that has achieved like a certain prominence in, in the UK. So it, it, it's insane to me that they would be doing our song or not our song or something based on our, our song. Yeah. It, it doesn't add up. That's not the way the world works. Yeah. yeah. When our friend Nardwar, the human serviette from Vancouver, interviewed the horrors, they mentioned that they were working in a record store at the time and would play Tyrants of Teen Trash all the time. And that was what made them want to start a band. And they asked one of them a question I read in an interview one time with the horrors. If you could see any concert of any time, what would it be? He said, like, the Grusoms in 1986, which wow. might have been humorous and disappointing, yeah. but flattering for us. At the same time. <laughs> yeah, actually, I, I, think, I think the reason we mentioned this horrors anecdote is because from my point of view, that's the only connection we have with any english like knowledge of us like i can't think of too many examples of of people yeah. people in in the uk knowing our our band you know yeah, yeah, we're, yeah. We're, we're very we're, we're, back in the 80s we before the internet we had no communication with people outside of fan letters which bobby would usually take their money by hamburgers and throw them in the garden <laughs> 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 yeah but we were getting so many every day you know you can't keep yeah. up with everyone but your first ep you know you released uh, you, you decided to release jack the ripper um your version which is a pretty punked up it is a pretty punked up version of, of the song isn't it you know it's uh, let's hear let's hear it let's let's hear your jack the ripper
yeah it's a great it's a great great take on it you know it's uh it's pretty wild and uh, and when you come over to london make sure you can visit some of the the sites you can go you can do a little sightseeing tour of jack the ripper spots if you'd like you know there's the spittle fields and brick lane and the ten bells pub you know oh fantastic you'll feel right john, at home john, john's gonna dress like a prostitute and sleep on the street well, the tour guides <laughs> again we war- again we warned you about that <laughs> yeah. all right well i'll take you down the 10 bells then and uh, we can hang around there how about that you know <laughs> that's great so awesome. then um so you released your first album tyrants of teen trash in 1985 and um now i've got a resident gruesomes expert behind the scenes here grant fisher really i wanted him to come on the podcast and do the interview but he um he was too shy um, um which for people that know grant will find it hard to believe because he is a man that turned up at at a hipsville which is a weirdsville do these weekend specials you know and um he yeah. turned up on a fancy dress dressed as a werewolf with a pink tutu um dancing down the front of the stage so um that old thing <laughs> but he's he should be there but he, he said he was too shy to come on uh, the podcast and, and join me which is a shame but um as I said, he, he sort of, um, he's, a, he's a big fan and he, he sort of said that, um, talking a bit about your, the local label that put you know, OG music and he said that this was an archetypal indie label formed by band members of Deja Voodoo. And the label's early releases were cassette only and they also produced a monthly fanzine, the Deja Voodoo Train. Time is a Trash was the label's 10th release and by then they had already released two volumes of the highly successful It Came From Canada combinations. And, uh, and Grant says that they also read that the owners retired the label when they turned 30, which is real Logan's run stuff. <laughs> but what was it like having the support of a local label and, and getting your first record out? Extremely important. And yes, that's our local scene that, that, that uh, we were part of. It's OG, by the way, not OG Records. Ah, OG. It's pronounced OG oh, because it's based... Yeah, it's based on a series of children's books here in Canada about this uh, primitive caveman who lived back in the day. And uh, it was like stories for kids about a caveman named, named Og. So that's, 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 where they, that's where they named it from. Well, Bob and I would be going out to see bands playing. We didn't really have friends who were musicians. When we yeah. met Jerry, he was like the most accomplished musician we knew. He could actually play like four chords. I think Bob only knew three. No, I didn't know chords. I didn't know. I chords. could only pluck strings, yeah. and Jerry knew like a couple of chords. So he was but, like the most the most advanced but, guy we knew. But there was local bands that we would go see, like Deja Voodoo, were a two man, like sort of like a, a you know white stripes, but with no cymbals and right. and only four yeah. guitar strings. They played what they called sludgeability, and they would do covers of things like Sixteen Tons, and you know they they had so, a, they had a good source material. Yeah. So again, ret- retro smart, meaning everything I'm going to throw at you has a reference point in the late 50s and early 60s and so yeah. there were a lot of other bands like that taking in different directions like uh, like a country rockabilly swing band called Ray Kondo and his hard rock goners who were friends of ours there was us the gruesomes who did like the 60s stuff uh, deja voodoo did like the two-man minimalist 50s stuff a whole bunch of bands almost all of them working in some sort of retro sphere yeah. And so, yeah. And so, so, and so they, they started an independent label. And back then, you know, it was all writing letters and mailing things out and putting up posters. Everything was, was, uh, yeah. And Bob and I went to go see the violent femmes playing at the roller skating arena, the Palladium in Montreal. And Deja Voodoo were opening up. And I don't know, were you there too, yeah, Jerry? There too. Yeah, Jerry. Before we knew Jerry well, he was there too. And we said, yeah, we're starting a band. And we would dress all cool and go down and tell them we're starting a band. We didn't have a band. We could barely play. No, but we did have a look. So that was like the most important thing. When, when, when John Knoll, our drummer, joined the band, he, he, he said he never had seen a band who spent so much time on their, on their hair and their clothes. But I think we realized that right away, that you have to have an image to sell to people if you want them to, to pay attention to you. Yeah, and I, the bands we liked uh, had that look, so we just, it's just what we liked. And also, I mean, it's true when, when John joined the band that uh, you, you realize that these guys are taking more time straightening their hair and ironing their shirts than, than practicing the, the songs. It's true, <laughs> as the only uh, non-original member, I joined the band, I had a so-called audition where I took a bus to Montreal for a weekend, yeah. and uh, there was no audition. I just watched them as they prepared their hair before the show, <laughs> got everything perfect. <laughs> bowl cuts and the straighten their hair and everything and they decided i had the right attitude it didn't really matter they never heard me play drums it just oh, right. <laughs> they decided i had the right sort of uh, contrarian attitude or something so yeah. that was it that was my so-called audition so you're in i was in so, so that's basically it just a bunch of like t- 
teenagers running around looking cool and yeah. telling everybody that, yeah, we're in a band and then going ahead and booking shows and then, you know, trying to learn how to play quick so we could do them. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, and in Canada back then, we were pro probably the only garage band in Montreal. Too. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. And we just, we didn't do, we, we were aware about the, uh, the garage scene in the States with the Chesterfield Kings and the Fuzzstones, but also it's, it, we weren't consciously doing the retro thing to be retro. It's just what we liked as well. Yeah. That's what we were into. Yeah, and it's ironic to us that the bands that we liked back then, the Gravedigger Five, the Chesterfield Kings, the Fuzz Tones, the Miracle Workers, that we're put in the same category now yeah. with those bands yeah. as being early 80s sort of originators of the raw. To us, those guys were miles above us. Oh, right. the Flesh Tones were a big one for us. We yeah. saw the Flesh Tones when we were really young. And but yes, like like John was saying, it's absolutely crazy. If you'd have asked us back then, how do you guys fit into the overall American garage scene? We would say, well, we don't. We're just kids from Canada, and these guys are like seasoned pro garage rockers who who are like totally on a different level from us. So it was the yeah. weirdest thing to be recast as part of that scene yeah. by these yeah. days. The it's thing rare. is, we were real, actual teenage garage uh, yeah. musicians, yeah, while well, these guys were way older and pro, and we were the real deal. Yeah, when, <laughs> when we opened for the Fuzz Tones, my brother was like 16, I think, at the time. And <laughs> seriously, I think I, I was 18, Bobby was 18, Jerry was 19, and my brother was 16. Oh, wow, fantastic. So let's have a um, let's, uh, good time to play a track from the, from the debut album. And um, this time we've got, a, uh, we've got a, a little request here. Well, we've got uh, the pick by a DJ Keb Darge, who'll be appearing at your show, spinning some tunes. And uh, his gruesome song of choice um, was uh, What's Your Problem? So oh, sure. Shall we have a little listen to that one? This is a great track from your debut album. Yeah. 
Uh, the little rave up part in that we totally got from bands like The Outsiders, very much influenced by Dutch music at that time. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. And then you just before I, I was reading that before your second album, something about a sort of serious accident. So what, what, so what happened? And, and did, it, it, did it sort of put the band out of action for a while? Yeah. Well, John Knoll had just joined our band as our replacement drummer for my brother. And we went and played a show in New York City as our first show. Then we came back to Montreal, did a few things, and we were planning a tour. And on the way back from Toronto, we had a blowout in the tire where our, I don't know, is there, is there a different word for tires in the UK? No, I have to spell it. No, that's no, right. They, yep. spe- they spell it. They spell it with a Y. It with a so, y. <laughs> so, so our tire with a Y went, yeah. went, 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 went flat, and then we, we spun around on the highway and rolled over three times down, the, down a ditch on the side of the road. Yeah, Jerry went right through the windshield. Oh, sorry. Excuse me. Jerry went through the wind screen. Wind screen. <laughs> Yeah. He ended up lying on the highway. Oh, sorry, the carriageway. But luckily, there was no glass at the time. It had already popped out during the rolls. So Jerry went through an empty windscreen, luckily for him. Yeah. Oh, wow. And, and, and it, was, it was pretty bad. We thought, we thought Jerry might have been dead at the time. He, and then he said, Mom, I don't want to go to work today. And we were like, As okay, he's well, lying on the side of the road. With his, blood, his face covered in blood. And he actually broke a few vertebrae in his back. It was lucky he wasn't paralyzed. Yeah, and it punched his teeth through his lip. Oh, and no. Now, now he's got like, yeah, now he's got like a James Bond scar. It's really cool, actually. Oh, wow. <laughs> And Bob's got a giant Frankenstein scar. And while a funny story is while in the emergency room, there were some other people there who were in the emergency room because their car went off the road when they saw a van flip over down the ditch. Oh, right? no. So we were, we, we, were, we were inadvertently responsible for their accident as well. Yeah, yeah. Of course, the uh, jokey humor never ends because Bob says to the doctor in the emergency room, uh, Oh, was it Doc will ever play guitar again? Do- Doc will ever play. Put- I'm Doc, I'm a musician. I got to know when I heal up, will I be able to play the violin? Uh, and he just, I remember the doctor. I'm not following for that one. That's an old one. <laughs> the, the, answer, the answer being, well, thanks, Doc, because I couldn't before. That was the same doctor. We said, hey, we're lucky that we're seeing you, doctor. And he said, yeah, you'd be seeing me anyway. I'm also the local coroner. <laughs> we laugh about it now. But the good thing that came out of it is that we canceled the tour and we did our new rec- a new right. uh, new record, yeah. Goosemania. This also helped us because uh, we didn't realize we had so many fans out in out west in Canada who were looking forward to seeing us. And when the tour got canceled, the demand for us went up higher. So by the time we went out with John, finally, the, after Goosemania came out, people were, were going nuts for us. Yeah, so we didn't have to slog it on the circuit. The publicity that we got from the canceled gigs and the crash actually made sure that we had like sold out shows when, when we actually did head out there. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, it's one of the few times, if not the only time, that the Gruesomes made headlines, not through a, a, an entertainment editorial, but rather actual news headlines. The, the newspaper headline says, said, Montreal banned in highway accident. It was oh, a, right. an actual piece of news and not like a focus on a musical band. So it was all a publicity stunt. Yeah, it was yeah. totally worth it. In fact, we're planning on doing it again, maybe to... <laughs> Don't tell Bob we're going to break his arm right before the next show. For- not before the London show. <laughs> oh, okay. So, yeah, so we're following up the... Um... On, on this sort of pretty bad accident, then you recorded your second album, Gruesome Mania. And as regular listeners to Retrosonic Podcast will know, uh, we're big fans of French music throughout the ages. So, and on this one, you, you uh, sort of released a classic track sang in French, Je Cherche. Yeah. Now that song is from a band from Quebec called Les Lutins, and which means the elves. Yeah, they were like 14 or 15 when they cut this. They're from a town called Saint-Hyacinthe. Here, here in Quebec, which is like a small town that for some reason put out a lot of bands back in the day. And very briefly, if anyone cares about this kind of stuff, back then, Quebec, the province of Canada where we come from, was in a massive historical transition, going from a very conservative society that was pretty much ruled by the Catholic Church in all walks of life, almost overnight changing into a modern society that had elements of uh, beat of music and sexuality and sort of a rejection of the established church. And it all happened in a very short period. They call it the quiet revolution. And all of a sudden, where there was no such thing before, Quebec started to produce stuff like rock and roll music. And it is fantastic and refreshing. All the Quebec bands are easily comparable to their American counterparts and have almost nothing to do with any music that was being made, say, in France or Europe at the time. So you, you would look at this as real North American rock 
even though it's being sung in French, the connections to Europe music are nil. Yeah, I'm, I'm it's correct. It's not me. yeah, yeah, at all. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's not. It's, it's, re- it's really tough. So the, the Lutens did their cool song, Je Cherche, and we grabbed it. Well, let's hear it. Let's hear yeah. Je Cherche. So I was going to say, what, what sort of influence does French music and culture have on you over there? Um, do you, do you, how do you view each other? You know, I mean, uh, do, do you take a lot of influence from French culture and music at all? Wow, no. I don't think we do, do we? <laughs> we don't like to talk. Um, we're, we're very American-oriented. So our favorite bands are like bands from Texas and stuff like that. But it should be said that when it comes to this, especially the music of the of the mid sixties, the differences between a bunch of punks, young punks with guitars in Texas and a bunch of young punks with guitars here in Quebec, it, it, there's not all that much. We're all working in the same direction, you know, kind of edgy, kind of mean, very simple, uh, trying to be the Rolling Stones. You know? We have to say that John, our drummer, John, he's from Ottawa. The rest of us are from Montreal and <laughs> he's always making fun of us for being like Anglophone Montreal. So M- Montreal, there's an English community in a predominantly French city, like, we're kind of apart from it. We're, we're apart yeah. from the rest of Canada in one sense and apart from the local French culture. Yeah, so Canada being predominantly an English-speaking nation, we live in the part of Canada that is 100% French. So much of our outside lives is done in French and then we speak English to friends and, and family and, and listen to and, English. And, and as Anglo-Montrealers, we feel like we, we were born here, where this is our place, and we're too cool for school. <laughs> <laughs> so any other tracks from uh, the second album that you particularly like to play? Yeah, if you please, how about Way Down Below? It's one of our absolute favorites, and it's still my favorite gruesome song. So may- maybe the folks would enjoy that. It's about Satan, by the way. Yeah, the, the guitar riff was written by Bobby, and the lyrics were sort of stolen from the Sonics, oh. He's Waiting. Oh, they're, like, co- they're totally like cop from... hundred percent. Yeah, they're totally like, cop from He's Waiting by the Sonics, in, in, in which a bad love affair means the, the, the woman in the relationship is going to end up in hell for some reason. Yes. <laughs> Someone else to 
So your third and final album on OG, I can say that now, I'm not OG, um, Hey was released in 1988, and that will be your last studio album of the 20th century. So this seemed like a busy period for the band, you know, it seemed like you had a lot of tours of Canada and America that you seemed to go down well in in New York in particular, Uh, lots of TV radio appearances, and I've seen the great video to Hey, which uh, apparently got lots of regular plays on Canada's top music channel. I I love this video, It's, it's a bit of a sort of garagey take on the monkeys. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. And we were just trying to rip off the monkeys. And <laughs> we benefit from a few things. We benefited from a few things. One is the CanCon, which is local TV and radio are forced by the government to play a certain percentage of yeah. Canadian can, content. Can, folks, CanCon stands for Canadian content, which is an, an effort by the government to keep Canadian uh, culture alive in the country. Also, my good friend uh, James Lord in Toronto was the uh, head programmer of the uh, videos at the uh, <laughs> our version of uh, Much Music called MTV. So he he, he played us regularly on. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing that helped about that video getting a lot of airplay is that it's really short. So when you're programming a bunch of videos and don't have time for a very long video to fill out your your uh, your space, you can throw this one in before you cut to break, and it's like it's perfect. I get it because it's instrumental. You don't even have to play the whole thing. You can fade it when you're ready. So that did us a lot of good. <laughs> yeah, it comes in at, what is it, 158 or something. Yeah, it's yeah. very short. And, and very strangely, the, uh, the song Hey was used in Utah in a public service uh, advert, Don't Text and Drive. And so they show people driving and texting, and then they go, Hey, don't text and drive. And they actually paid us like 500 bucks to use our song for that. Oh, ad. right. <laughs> it's also bilingual, too. Yeah, That's it's right. bilingual too. Hey, it works in English, French. It's trilingual, Jerry. It also works in Spanish. <laughs> Julio Iglesias also had an album called Hey. That's true. Oh, well. <laughs> well, I mean, we can't see the, the, the video, but obviously um, I'd recommend people going to check it out on YouTube, but we can play the track. So fantastic song from your third album. This is Hey. So great track, but then um, then you decided to split up. Um, what in 1990 or so? You know, you decided to call it a day. It just seemed to be things were going well. Why why did you end it then? Sort of, it dwindled down. Things were not going well, Steve. They no. were very much the opposite of going well. Jerry had left the band, and we had got a replacement guitar player. And we, we did one tour, and that one tour was, we realized we had made a terrible mistake. And, <laughs> well, and, yeah. And, and, and decided that rather than trying to retool the band or to do stuff, that was it. We were going to start doing stuff which was not good. Well, there's a ceiling in, in North America, right? Like I was saying before, there's no way that some record executive would take a chance on something weird and different. So there's no chance that anyone would invest lots of money in us to record a 
a, a big album and put us on tour and give us sponsorship. There's no chance of that happening. But nevertheless, we were doing well. So we found ourselves in a position where we were playing crowded clubs with zero security and uh, no organization. So we were, we were big enough just for every gig to be a real hassle without, without, without the promise of, of, of a next step. Like we kind of knew like, this is it. Like we're not going any farther than the next step up won't be a 10,000 seat arena. It'll, 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 it'll be another small packed club where, you know. Yeah. We were given all the opening slots for a while for like every band that came here. They, they hired us to play. The, we played with the Jesus and Mary chain and all these different bands that came yeah. and just put us on the bill. But for us, nah, we, 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 it wasn't fun anymore. The, basically, what it comes down to is we weren't enjoying ourselves. We broke up the band, but we had some contractual obligations. So yeah, we got, got Jerry to come uh, back. Yeah, I came back. I had left because I couldn't make I couldn't play a tour. So then eventually I came back to finish a tour. Mm. And then we, we still played shows till like 1992. Yeah, we, we, we had a lot of fun putting posters up. Last show ever. We just didn't record <laughs> anything. Yeah, we, didn't. we did about three or four of those last show ever. <laughs> Last chance ever to see the Grusoms. We so, did like three or four of them. It became a running gag. So it just dwindled. 90, 92 was when it really, we stopped playing. Yeah. And, and mm-hmm. then came back in 99. We got back together to record a uh, cave-in. Yeah. We were yeah. hanging out one day. And I think Jerry was over. And we were getting kind of drunk. And we said, hey, it would be really fun if we played a gruesome show. We called John in Ottawa. And John got the phone call. And, and it was uh, an offer. What? Have you had the offer yet? No. The show? Well, I think what happened was, is that we were speculating, hey, you know that band we, we were in like, you know, eight, eight to 10 years ago and that we hadn't thought of for all this time. Imagine if we did a reunion show. Do you think anyone would show up? So we called a promoter in Toronto. Am I correct? Yeah. Who was it? Who we called? Uh, you know, it was yeah, yeah, it was Craig at the. Oh uh, right, Craig Lasty. At the, yeah, we at we the, phoned some connection in in Toronto and sort of said, uh, "Do you think it would be like would work if we did like a reunion show? Is there anyone around who would remember our band?" Yeah, and then we got offered like four times what we'd ever made before to play. Mm-hmm. And we said, yeah, yeah, let's do it for fun. This was it. This is the major turning point. Suddenly we had become legends and it was, it was because we had been inactive for so long, the name had stuck around. So there was this idea that we were like big and huge and important. And so that's the big difference. So, yeah. so, so the, 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 the internet also helped us yeah. get more popular. The thing that remember is that yeah. like, we didn't stop playing music. We just stopped playing gruesome stuff. So yeah. I, I yeah, we were we were playing in many different bands locally around town and stuff. So we so we kept up our chops. We we were still good musicians. Yeah, yeah. Relatively speaking, we got better by the time we played Caven. You can quote that one. Yeah. So this let's get on to to Caven. So the, so the, uh, this was we love that one. I mean, this is a great record, isn't it? Because it, it it sort of sounds really even I listen to it now it sounds so sort of fresh and uh, you know really a really great sort of punchy sound you know and um we we really pleased how it came out i mean had you been writing yes. this material in in and building up to it or was it really spontaneous yeah. Well, what happened? No. So what I think the best way to look at that from a from sort of like a conceptual point of view is that uh, for 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 10 years, the band stopped growing, which is great because had we continued to grow, our sound definitely would have changed and we would have like branched out into into the music that we were listening to at the time, which would be, I'm guessing, like R&B and, and, and stuff. Yes, yeah, like maybe country, the birds and all that. Yeah, all that, all that kind of stuff. So what happened was it put a it put a stop to our progress. And so when we picked it up 10 years later with Caven, it was just, well, pure garage because we appreciated it more. We were absolutely into it. And we had like 10 years of, of, of without, without doing anything. So. And we would always question ourselves, is this something that the Grusons would have done in 1987 or 88? Yeah, okay, then yeah. it's on. If it was like anything yeah. that didn't quite fit. And Bobby is quite the prolific songwriter in that he's written thousands of songs, most of which have never been recorded. But he had, he, had, he had written songs for different types of different styles of music. And we just put them all as gruesome stuff. Yeah, well, it's a great record. And again, going back to our resident uh, Grusmas fan, Grant, you know, he, he says, I've got to say that he reckons it's arguably the best of an already impressive back catalogue. He said, it's so difficult to choose uh, so many great tracks. But um, I don't know if you're going to agree with his choice here. He's gone for Stop It Girl. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that, that, yeah we'll we, be, we still play that one. Yeah, we still play that one. We'll be doing that in London for sure. Great. Well, let's hear it for Grant. This is uh, Stop It Girl from the fantastic Cave-In album. Heart. 
Yeah, so then you headed off to your very first European tour, you know, and you, you play shows in Germany, Italy, Belgium and Switzerland. So I'd like to know, you know, what the experience was like, any favourite cities, any National Lampoon's European vacation style experiences? Was it was it all-, all like that. <laughs> all of it. We, we, we had no idea what to expect. We had toured Canada. We usually had a driver who also took care of, like, checking us into hotels and things. But this time we were just the four of us on our own in a foreign continent, Driving a standard transmission. Up and down the Swiss Alps. The, we had asked our promoter in Berlin to, to book us as much as possible. We said, this is our like, only chance in Europe. And we want to make sure that we have like, a lot of shows so that we can, you know, we can, we can earn, earn some money over there. So please book us every night. And he took us literally, and I think we were there 21 days and played 18 or 19 shows. Right. He told us, I, I had to get out the atlas and a magnifying glass to find small towns in which you could play on the way. We were still young enough. Yeah, we were yeah, still young that enough. Was a, that was a really funny thing. People didn't believe we were the original band. They're like, but you're so young. Yeah, because we were like 17 when we started. This was yeah. only like 10 years later. So was the tour, was it, um, did a promoter approach you? Or I mean, did you, was it something you wanted to do? Was it fan led? I mean, how did it, how did it start off? It started off because the, our record caving got put out on CD by a local label in Montreal that called itself Tyrant Records. I guess based on our Tyrants of Teen Trash, they were trying to do some garage releases. And they got an offer from a German company called Jaguar Club Records in Stuttgart, and they put out the vinyl version of our record. And so the Canadian government gives people money to promote Canadian culture. And so we had heard about other people getting these grants from the government. And so we applied for it and we needed to have sales statistics to prove that it was worth going. So we told the guy, just lie. And so, so we ended up getting like a, a lot of money from the government to go over and tour. So we ended yeah. up actually making a, a few thousand dollars. Fantastic. So how did it go down? How did, how did the, 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 what was the reaction like? Were you surprised that people over in Europe were aware of the band and were, were the shows good? Yes. Yes, they were very good. We were moderately surprised, although a lot of shows were, were also working gigs we were, where we were playing to an audience who wasn't 100% familiar with who we are or and what our, what our cases, scene was. Zero or in familiar. some cases, 0%. But, but we would pick up pockets of, of interest and knowledge here and there. That was in the year 2000, uh, 2001. I'll just jump ahead a little bit and say we were not as surprised on that tour as we were in 2018, 19, and 20 when we started traveling to places like Spain and stuff mm-hmm. where we were knocked out by the amount of people who knew us and recognized us. So that tour that we did in the 2000s, yes, we got a taste of recognition, but nowhere near as much as we got more we have had more recently. Also, touring mm. Europe is way more fun than touring Canada because touring mm. Canada is a living hell in, which, huge. in, it's which, huge. in which it's like, like we have literally gone around the world more than once by touring Canada five times. Yeah. We, we, we have circumnavigated the globe in terms of yeah, the amount of kilometers we've done and it's boring as hell until you get to the Rockies, there's nothing there. Europe is, is interesting, exciting to drive through the Alps all the nice stuff. I never thought I would have enjoyed Germany so much. Germany was a fantastic country for us. We, Mm. people were great. The food was great. Everything about it was really nice. We miscalculated, right? We thought, okay, well, we're driving, you know, we're driving, we're driving to the city. It seems far away. Let's go. So we drive for a couple of hours because in Canada, if you're driving between cities, you're going to drive for 12 hours. It's just the thing you do. So we get in the van and we go and we realize we overshot the city by by, by 200 kilometers, we have to yeah. turn back Well, the, it's, the difference is the scale on a map in Canada, it's like one inch is like 100 <laughs> kilometers, whereas in, on a European map, like one inch is like 10 kilometers. For instance, John came here from Ottawa for our rehearsals. The drive from Ottawa to Montreal is two major capital cities in Canada, two of the most yeah. important cities in Canada. No one on the road and nothing but freaking trees the whole way. It's like, the mo- it's, it's ridiculous. If this was Europe, it would be jam-packed with people everywhere if it was if it was the uk you would roll past little towns with little pubs and restaurants and then you would roll into the next town but in canada it's just a strip of ribbon cut through trees and you will not see anything except possibly a moose and and if you're really (laughs) lucky like you'll get gas before you have to take like a 12 hour trip where there's no gas station in between. so it's good i mean good so were there any particular let's sort of go 
get a bit of music. So were there any songs that you found, was there any, any tracks that really hit with the European audiences that you found that there were people were shouting out for at gigs or was there anything that, that really hit a chord with them? Well, we, we know we, we had been playing the Soro song, No, 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 that Jerry sings. Yeah, we'll be playing in London too. And uh, we, we had sort of forgot that the Soros were a British band, but huge in Italy. And when we played in Italy, People went nuts when we played No, 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 No. We forgot. Oh, yeah, that's right. Oh, yeah, it, right. This was in the top 40 yeah. back then. Well, we can hear, let's, let's, play, let's play The Sorrows and let's, let's give it a spin. I've broken into Because of you You walked out on me You set me free So you played um, a bit more recently, you played at Spain's fantastic Dracula Carnival. And then you toured again in Spain and, uh, and played the Washina Washina Festival in Valencia. Well, the, the uh, way it worked was we got offered to play at the fantastic Dracula Carnival, went over with no expectations and were blown away by our reception. We played really well. People loved us. We had a great time. And we decided to take a week vacation after the show and hang out in Benidorm in a condo on the Mediterranean that we rented. Yeah. So we thought we were living like rock stars. Well, yeah, <laughs> we kind of were in a sense. I guess that was the, I guess that was really the first time we had a sense that there was like an established community that considered us to be important, and which, we'd ne- which we'd never had before and, con- and never considered. And let's face it, touring sucks. It's not fun. Um, this is fun. We had fun for like the first time. Like even when you're playing shows and you're on tour, it's a, what do the British say? It's a slag. It's a, no, it's it's not a, a slag. That's not a slag. It's a slog. A, sl- a slog? A no, slog? I don't think the British say, I think we say slog. <laughs> slog it was, yeah. it was a lot of work. We, we had to, you it know, was, yeah. hefting gear around up fire escapes to get into bars and stuff. It was terrible. Mm-hmm. But yeah. this time, we, we actually had a lot of fun. We got to hang out. We got to meet our friends like the Kaisers. Isn't that cool? Yeah. The, Bobby's a huge fan of the Kaisers. Man, that was amazing. We got to meet all those guys, Kaiser George and everybody. We had a lot of fun. We had a great time. And Bob said it was the best experience he's ever had playing in the band, ever. Yeah. And before yeah. we even left Spain, we got an offer to play at the, uh, the, the festival in Mexico City. So we said, yeah. we're on a high from having played. We said, sure, let's do it. We yeah. played Mexico City to the biggest audience we've ever played, yeah. 3,200 people. Wow. Yeah, so ever, ever since then, it's been like sort of like these high-profile gigs where a whole bunch of people who know Garage and some who even know us congregate in one spot, and we can go play there. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. In Mexico, we met a friend of ours, Arnaldo, down there, who invited us to play Costa Rica, and we thought, really? And we went and played Costa Rica, and it was fantastic. Yeah. So it's interesting, you know, how, um, that's going back to sort of Spain, for example, you know, why you can you connect with a certain sort of audience. It's, it's funny how these things work, isn't it? You know, I mean... Well, they know Jerry Spanish. That's, that's probably well, why. Ah, there, there you go. More, there seems to be more of an awareness of uh, the genre, the garage music. And yeah, music yeah, some great Spanish bands, you know. Um, also, Las Aspidoras, uh, worth checking out. Brilliant yeah, band. So I think part of our success in Spain is due directly to Juanito Wow. The, mm-hmm. the singer for Huawei Los Args. Uh, he's like the Spanish king of garage. He actually has a Gruesome's tattoo on his arm. He wrote the liner notes <laughs> for our 45 that we put out over there. Yeah. And he, he was, he's a massive Gruesome's fan. He's telling everybody, you got to see the Gruesome's, book the Gruesome's. 
Yeah, so then you um, you released a single, was it on, on a Spanish label as well? Yep. And um, so, so tell us a little bit how that came about. Well, it was suggested to us that perhaps we'd want to release there. And we hadn't written any new songs in forever. And Bobby says, yeah, I got a song. And we we're like, oh, OK, we can do it. And we hadn't heard Bobby's song. You didn't know what it was. But we just knew it would be good. And then he showed us the song. We're like, perfect. And we needed a B-side for the single. And so we always loved Lotes Mockers from Uruguay. And so with the old song that I was sitting on called Someone Told a Lie and our idea to cover Lost Mockers from Uruguay, their song called Make Up Your Mind, it came together fast. And it was because we were looking for a festival to play. Yeah, we got to do one of these festival gigs again so we can take a holiday in, in, in Spain. And so we got booked on the Watchina Watchina Festival in uh, Valencia. And uh, so we said, oh, great, we got our festival gig. So we'll be able to play the festival and then we can just relax on the Mediterranean beach for the rest of the time. But what happened was people thought, oh, wow, the gruesomes are coming to Spain. I want to book them. I want to book them. So it started turning into this mini tour. And then we found out, that I said, and you know what they think, those Spaniards? They think that a new record release would be good. So let's do that. Oh, OK, give them what they want. And they turned it into this remarkable product that is not just like a cool garage single, but comes with a full comic of the gruesomes done in cartoon form, like Scooby-Doo doing stuff in Spain that actually comes with part of it. So they went all to in town Spanish. on it. Yeah, all in Spanish. Liner notes, the, the comic book, everything. Yeah, so, so basically we did nothing. We, we said, hey, we'd like to come to Spain so we can take a vacation. And then we ended up with a tour and a record and a comic and a, uh, and a lot of, lot of interest. We didn't, we didn't do anything. Yeah. Thanks for taking the time to see us today. It's been a real pleasure chatting to you and uh, learning more about the gruesomes. And of course, we're going to look forward to seeing you play on Saturday, July the 2nd at, uh, at Weirdsville. And that's at the Fiddler's Elbow in Camden, um, along with the Jack Cades supporting you, a great band, and uh, DJ Keb Darge on the decks. Um, yeah, it'll be your first trip to London. And uh, so there's a, a lot of people looking forward to the show. Um, I, hope so. I, I hope so. I I hope, yeah, we're definitely looking forward to this show. We've always wanted to play the UK. It's super cool. I certainly hope so. I can't judge what the level of garage consciousness in the UK is in general. And I certainly can't tell how many people might have heard of our band. Like, I, I'm having a hard time figuring that one out. Well, I think I think Weirdsville is, is a great place because it's, it's very much... Uh, 
a great community, you know, a great bunch of people. They do a lot of regular shows and they do specialise in bringing over uh, a lot of foreign bands into the UK. So it's, um, I, I think it's a, it's a, if you're going to play somewhere, I think if I was to, to think about where, where would be good for you to play, I think this is, this is going to be a great, a great night for you. Well, It'll be a good audience. Those... You, you'll find it's going to be a good crowd for you. And Bob, we have to remember to pronounce it, was it not garage? As garage. Oh, garage? Garage. 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 I, hope, you know. I certainly hope our UK fans can, can, can understand our thick Canadian accents. <laughs> <laughs> I, know it's, I know it's hard for, for, for you folks. Yeah. yeah, well, we're looking forward to that. It's going to be a real gas. Yeah, well, you, I'm, mean, I'm gonna be, you, mean, you mean it's going to be a real petrol? No. Real petrol. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been great talking to you guys, and thanks so much for uh, taking the time to, to come to Retrosonic Podcast Virtual Studio. And um, I said it'd be great to meet you in the, in the flesh. I'd like to say one thing. If anyone, is coming to the sh- if anyone is coming to the show and wants to bring the gruesomes a present, I would recommend bringing some of that stuff you guys have over there in England called lemon curd. It's, okay. it's, <laughs> it's, it's, if, if for folks who don't know that, know what it is, it's like, it's like a lemon meringue pie filling in a jar, like jam. So you can spread it on toast and turn your toast into like lemon meringue man, pie. Is that stuff good? Yeah. Oh, man, is that ever good. We don't get that here. Yeah, another thing that we love about UK food is... That when you have black as a flavor in candy, it's not licorice. It's cassis. It's it's currant, black currant. Yeah, black currant. Every time you have black jelly beans or anything, they're always licorice flavor. Like those jelly babies that are the black ones. I, th- I was throwing them out. I thought they were licorice, and then I realized, oh my god, it's black currant. It's the best of all. Oh, Brits have the best candy. We're we're gonna go nuts for oh, sure. Yeah, nobody can Ginger. beat the UK for sweets. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Just just make sure you put all that on your rider. Tell tell Mr. A and Alex from Weirdsville. Uh, we, we, get a, we get a only ride. black currant flavored jelly babies you have to remove all the other ones i want a bowl of black currant jelly bib yeah and a jar of that lemon curd no problem well it's going to be great so i think you'll be you'll be welcomed with open arms and probably going to get lots of lemon curd thrown at you as well we're hoping if anyone wants to make our day they can bring up some of that lemon curd those jars hurt bobby well we're looking forward to seeing you and i said thanks very much indeed so don't forget i'll put a um i'll put a feature at retromanblog.com um where there'll be links to the gruesomes and of course Course, where you can buy tickets to the Weirdsville show and uh, please check that out so to play us out um let's um yeah, let's let's play your latest single the as we spoke about this was the one that was released in Spain this is a fantastic track someone told a lie so um thanks for your time guys and we'll look forward to seeing you in in London and uh, all the best to you all the best to you Steve thanks Thank a million you, Steve. Thanks, Steve. thanks a lot cheers cheers this is uh, the wonderful gruesomes and someone told a lie <laughs> 